Hi everyone, welcome to Lecture 7N of Useful Genetics, where we're going to deal with the second of our three problems where we work through one complete generation of inheritance. In this problem, we're going to think in reverse, starting with information about the offspring and thinking backwards to make an inference about a parent genotype. So here's the problem. Again, you're a plant breeder. Now you're breeding a plant for improved growth and you've got progeny of a plant that grew well, but you don't have the original parent plant, so you can't genotype it. It died. Um, so you genotype the progeny at two loci that are known to affect growth, and you want to use the progeny genotype information to infer what the parent genotype was. The plant self-pollinate, so both parents are going to be the same parent, and the loci that you genotype them at are unlinked, so you don't need to worry about crossing over. Here's the progeny genotypes and numbers of individuals. That looks scary, so let's ignore the numbers. First, good strategy. Simplify the problem first. And rather than trying to solve a complicated problem, think about simpler components of the problem first. Step two, well, yeah, I don't know how to think about this, so let's draw a picture. Drawing in solving genetics problems, drawing a picture is always a good idea. So let's draw a picture of the plant. Here's the plant, here's some progeny. These, now we can say, oh yeah, these are the genotypes of the different progeny, and they grow to different degrees. Some of them are shorter and fatter, some of them are taller and skinnier. And there's the parent. These all grew from seeds on this parent. We want to know the genotype of this plant. Drawing a picture doesn't get you to the answer, but it makes it easier to think about how to get to the answer. Okay, we drew a picture. Next, well, if we're looking at a cross, it really can't hurt to draw a mating square to help us to think about the issues. Because the mating square combines thinking about the physical issues and the genetic issues, and it reminds us to think about the genotypes of the gametes in thinking about the genotypes of the offspring. So now we've got our mating square. And we figured that we needed to make a 4x4 four four mating square because we've got two alleles of two genes. So that's four possible kind of combinations of alleles in gametes. Now hold that thought. That's going to come in important later. So there's our mating square. We've ignored the numbers. We drew the parent plant. We drew the mating square. Hmm, now, what are we going to do next? Well, let's just think about what's going on. We've got the progeny genotypes. If we're going to use the mating square, we need to think about the offspring genotypes. But we don't want to think about the numbers. Those are still kind of scary. So let's just think about, well, there were some gametes of all of these genotypes. Does that help us see a way to think about the answer? Well, yeah, it kind of does, because the, it tells us there were some, some progeny got two big F alleles and two big G alleles. The only way they could get that was if the parent gametes were big F, big G. Both, par the, both parents were the same parents, so the parent genotype had to be able to produce gametes that were big F, big G. But some of the progeny were homozygous for little f, little g. The only way that could come about is if the parent plant could produce gametes that were little f, little g. What kind of genotype could produce both of these kinds of gametes. Well, only one parent genotype could do that. The parent would have to be big F, little f, big G, little g. So maybe that's our answer. The parent was heterozygous for both alleles, and 
We know that must have been the case because of the genotypes of the progeny that were produced. And we know that without even looking at the numbers, as long as we know there were some progeny that had these genotypes. Okay, that's a pretty strong hypothesis about what's going on. But I think before we jump to the conclusion that that must be the right answer, it would be smart to check it out by comparing the genotypes that our hypothesis predicts with the actual genotypes and frequencies that were seen. And to do that, we're going to have to work through the mating square, filling in the frequencies of all the genotypes that we, the gamete genotypes, seeing if we get numbers that agree with the numbers that were actually observed. It would be rash just to jump to the conclusion that we must be right. It's always prudent to do, think of something you can do to check that your answer really does explain what you're seeing. So in this case, we can say, okay, we know that gametes, there must have been big F, big G gametes, and little, oops, little F, little G gametes, big F, big G, little F, little G, and big F, little g, and little f, big g, and big f, little g, and little f, big g, etc. And you can then see that because each of these, if the parent was indeed big F, little f, big g, little g, each of these would have been present in equal proportion. There would have been a quarter of each of these. So once each of these squares is then one sixteenth of all the offspring. One sixteenth are going to be big F, big F, big G, big G. One sixteenth are going to be little F, little F, little G, little G, etc. We can then calculate out of the total number of progeny that were checked, how many would we have expected to have been homozygous for the big alleles or homozygous for the little alleles, given that we genotyped a total of 66 offspring plants. And well, the answer is that it's going to be 1 16th of the 66, and that's approximately 4.1 plants we would have expected. How many plants actually were of these genotypes? Well, there were three of the big F, big F genotype. There were five of the little f, little f genotype. That's pretty close to four. You can then go through and fill in all the other offspring genotypes, combine the ones that are identical, and get the actual predicted numbers and compare them with the numbers in the information you're given. If they're similar, that's a good reason to accept that your hypothesis is probably right. So we've solved the problem in which we had to go backwards. We had the offspring genotypes and we wanted to infer the parent genotype. And to do this, we used a number of, not tricks, but ways to make the task easier that helped us think through this fairly complex problem. First, we streamlined the problem. When we had a complicated looking set of information, we stripped the information down to a simpler level by ignoring the numbers to start with. That made it easier to think about. Then we used a drawing to guide our thinking. The drawing won't tell us the answer, but it helps make the abstract information more concrete, which always makes it easier to think about. Then we drew a mating square. Again, a way of guiding our thinking reminds us that, well, we need to figure out what the gamete frequencies are going to be. And normally we'd want to know that before we filled in the mating square. But in this case, we could work backwards from things we know the mating square must contain to what kinds of gametes must have existed to produce it. And then that thinking suggested an easy way to answer the problem by focusing only on the homozygous offspring genotypes because they had very explicit implications for what could be the possible gamete genotypes. 
And then finally, we checked that our hypothesis works. We had found an easy way, but we didn't say, oh, we found an easy way, we're sure we're right. We'd just check off that answer, go on to the next problem. Instead, we used our hypothesis to predict the rest of the information in the problem, predict the frequencies of the other genotypes of offspring to make sure that our hypothesis was consistent with the information that we'd given, that we'd been given. Coming up next is the third of our full generation problems. And in this one, we're going to consider quite a different situation. Instead of having a large population of offspring, we'll consider a simple family with two parents and a child, and then we'll think about a couple of grandparents as well. And we'll use a pedigree drawing to guide our thinking this time. I hope to see you there.